Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kason. Today we're here to talk to you about Vagrant Story. Yes. Um, so we're going to do this one a little differently than we have in the past. Usually on our first episode of a new game, what we do is a long development history section. Sometimes that takes up the whole episode. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like episode two, we finally start talking about the game. Yeah, episode two is the real episode one. Right. So we want to change that this time because usually the first episode gets the most traction, the most views. Yeah, so yeah. we want to jump straight into the game as soon as we can and bring up development history at relevant points along the way. We're going to try that out and see how it goes. You guys let us know if you like that or not. We'll see how it goes. But I think hopefully that this will allow us to jump straight into the story and start talking about the game itself and might be a little bit more engaging as an opening episode. I am putting hard time limits on these now. <laughs> no, um, no more four hour, <laughs> four hour podcast. It's just way too much work to edit a four hour podcast. It is, it's a lot. But also we are recording <laughs> another one right on the back of this for our exclusive podcast. This is a new for change Patreon. to Patreon. Yeah. So on Patreon we will be doing analysis podcasts rather than Q&A podcasts. There will be some Q&A still involved. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we're going to be doing analysis on shorter experiences, movies, movies short yeah. games, shows, shows, things yeah, like that. Things like that. Um, again, that's a monthly release, mm. exclusive podcast or Patreon. So, um, anyways, we're going to be recording that on the back of this. So, that's why we've got that time limit. So, without further ado, let's jump straight into this. Now, the only thing I want to start off with is at least talking about key personnel, key developers. Kay. And this will be fast because most of these people are exactly the same yes. as those who worked on Final if Fantasy If you tactics. want an in-depth story as to exactly where they all came from and how they all got here, yeah. the episode one of Final Fantasy Tactics, it's almost all the exact same, same people. people. It's amazing. <laughs> this team, and even on to FF14, it's yeah. like the same team. They just keep moving together. This is basically the Final Fantasy Tactics team's next game yeah. after Final Fantasy Tactics. So, Yasumi Matsuno... Writer, director, and producer. Yep. We all know him. Um, Taku Murata, we didn't talk about him on Final Fantasy Tactics too much, but he is the lead programmer on both games. Um, Hiroshi Minigawa and Akihiko, yeah, Minigawa. Akihiko Yoshida, or the art directors and character designers, same as with Tactics. Yep. Now, here is a new credit, and we're going to talk about him maybe a little bit. Jun Akiyama. Akiyama. He was an event uh, event scene director okay, on this yeah. game, mm -hmm. um, and a writer too. Hmm. So he worked, I, I would think, with Yasumi Matsuno on the writing, but he also uh, did a lot of work on the cutscenes. Oh, um, nice. So camera work and things oh, of that, good. that which, sort. Which right. was very well done, by the way. It's extremely well done. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, he's actually really good. There's a great interview. I'm going to put this in the... Um, in the comments or maybe in the, pin, in the pin comment or in the description or something. There's a great new article on, sh uh, I think it's called, what's the website called? Is it Shmupulations? <laughs> Anyways, it's a great resource um, specifically for old game interviews, old RPG interviews and things like that. Um, yeah, shmup, Shmuplations is what it's called. Shm <laughs> um, and uh, it's a really long in-depth review from, or interview from 1999 um, that... Uh, I, it, this was just brought to my attention. I, did, I hadn't even read a lot of this for my original Final Fantasy Tactics oh, review. Really? So there's a lot of new oh, info in here no way. that I'll try to bring up too. So That's great stuff cool. there. That'll be in the comments. You guys should go uh, read that for yourselves because yep. they interview basically everybody from each department. So Jun Akiyama gets yeah. interviewed in that. Taku Murata gets interviewed in that. Akihiko Yoshida and Hiroshi Mirigawa get uh, interviewed. Matsuno gets interviewed. So... A lot of really great stuff there. Mm. And of course, uh, Hitoshi Sakimoto returns as the composer for the game. Yes. So, a yeah. lot of the same guys uh, that worked on the last game. Now, uh, new to uh, this game, uh, Alexander O. Smith, who did translation and English localization and rewriting, essentially, mm. essentially for the English version of the game. Um, yeah. We talked a lot about in the Final Fantasy Tactics analysis how... Some people are kind of, eh, I don't know about this um, pseudo-Shakespearean language oh, yeah. that they're using, right? Right. And um, while I love it in that game, 
the way it's done in this game is mm. better. It's yeah, yeah. actually much better here yeah, than it is in Tactics. There are some moments in Tactics War of the Lions that I agree read like purple prose. They're trying too hard to make it sound poetic mm. and flowery and it doesn't sound totally yeah. natural. This game, that is not the case. It is written in that style, but it is like done and executed like exceptionally well. Yeah. Um, so I love the dialogue in the English version of this game. And Alexander O. Smith is my favorite translator and localizer who ever worked at Square. Nice. Um, I think he's just amazing. So we'll be talking about him a little bit too. Okay, so all that being said, those are the dudes who worked on it. We'll get into more details on them as we go through it. Um, I think a couple of the things that you should probably know going into this game, and I made a whole video that would have come out on Monday um, about how to get started, like tips on how to get started. I'll talk more about gameplay there and things of that nature. But this is a game, that one thing I love about this game is it's a smaller scale story. Yeah, yeah. That still has really high stakes. Right. I think that, is particularly in JRPGs, the, you can get some fatigue with this save oh, the world plot. I actually hate it. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> you know, one of the criticisms of um, I Am Setsuna was yeah. that it all takes place in the same region of snow. Yes, the snowy right. Blade. It's all snow. The whole and I'm time. thinking, good. <laughs> like for, for whatever reason, every RPG needs to include, you, here's the forest, here's the desert, here's the mountains, here's the snow, here's the jungle, here's the ocean, and it's like you're going and it's the whole world. Mm. You're traversing the entire world because you're important and you're saving the world. And I think that does get very fatiguing. You see it in movies a lot now. And a lot of times I am really drawn to stories of scale where it's a local village, uh, you know, battling against the dragon that's trying to kill them. And they're, you know, trying to survive somehow. And like, I, I think that that's, it's, it's, um, it's easier to tell that kind of story, but the epics, the big, the grand epics, yeah. those are the ones that people maybe spend the most money on. And so yes. everyone's trying to recreate that over and over and over and right. over. And I wish people would just stop trying to do that and just yeah. kind of tell some localized stories every now and then. But like you said, the, the, this um, story here, what happens here in Le Amand has like massive consequences right. like for the world. Right. But... It's just, basically the whole game takes place in just Le Amon. A single city. And that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel shortchanged in any no, way. No, no, no. <laughs> I welcome that. I think that yes, we I need more great. stories told on that smaller yeah. scale. Otherwise, the big Save the World plots start to feel less big and epic. Because sure. you're, you're doing it in too much repetition, right? Mm -hmm. So I think every once in a while, it's nice to get something smaller scale that still accomplishes or is able to create really big stakes. Yeah. Um, and so I really love that. A, a quote from Matsuno about that. Uh, he said, if FF, Final Fantasy, is the game industry version of a major Hollywood <laughs> movie, then Vagrant <laughs> Story is an independent movie to be watched quietly in a small movie theater. Yes. The scale is different, but the burning enthusiasm and dreams behind the scenes are the same as in the majors. That, I think, perfectly sums up yeah. essentially what this is. It feels like an yep. independent movie almost. It does. Um, oh, lower budget. Lower budget, yeah. smaller scale, but like really, really passionately made. Yes, and artistically off the charts. Yes. <laughs> like so well done. So well done. Absolutely. And, and willing to take certain risks that maybe like a bigger game wouldn't take. Mm, that sort of right. thing. Yep. Or, or a big movie, might, you know, a big tentpole movie wouldn't take some risks that an independent filmmaker might make on a little project. Yeah. So I think that's a really good way to view it. Um, similarly, uh, on the gameplay front of things, this game was not made for the uh, casual RPG enjoyer. <laughs> Let's call it that. Uh, this true, is a true. very in-depth, and again, I made another video on it, so I won't take a lot of time on this. Um, it is, this game is very difficult. Right. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily call it difficult in the same sense that I would like a really hard action game or something where, oh man, like the you timing, you know, perfect yeah, reaction yeah. time and you gotta be able to, you know, use an arsenal of abilities and know exactly like, you know, read uh, bosses and things like that. It's right. not that, it's just a very complex and layered set of systems yeah, yeah. that if you don't understand how they work, you can be very confused as to why you're doing like one or two damage <laughs> to things. <laughs> well, you're talking about weapon crafting. Yes. And, yes, yeah, yeah. There's weapon crafting, there's, yeah. um, you know, reading enemy weaknesses and targeting the right body part. Targeting the right, yes, exactly. Using the correct type of weapon against the correct body yeah. part. 
like for that correct making and, sure yeah. that you're buffing and debuffing every yes. single time it's like there's so yeah, many yeah, layers yeah. to it so yeah. um matsuno said on this unlike the final fantasy series and metal gear solid vagrant is geared toward hardcore gamers it shouldn't be bought with the expectation of a final fantasy or metal gear solid so he's talking about like there's two kind of different vectors whether you're at rock or jazz or japanese versus french cuisine or you know, things like that. It's just a very different mm -hmm. thing that they were going for from the start. So you should set your expectation for that. <laughs> this is not a Final Fantasy game. This is a really different thing. Um, but if, you're, if you have the patience, I guess, to sort of like really dive into those, it can be very satisfying. It's a very balanced game. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like conquering some of these challenges is really, really awesome. Um, okay. So, with that out of the way, um, let's jump into the start screen. Okay. So, as with Final Fantasy Tactics, you need to leave the screen alone for a while. <laughs> yeah, which I, I knew that, um, but I didn't know that I had to keep leaving it alone for even longer. Well, do you know what's funny? Was that <laughs> on Final Fantasy Tactics, uh -huh. I thought I had done it. There's actually another extra movie on top of what we even covered. So oh, really? there was like two movies that you have to, okay, so you have starts, you have like the regular movie that plays, the regular demo. Yeah, yeah. And then you sit on the start screen and it plays a movie. Then it goes back to the demo thing and repeats that, goes to the start screen. You leave that alone, it plays another movie. And I thought, I did it. I got through <laughs> everything. You have to do it one more time. No way. And then there's a whole extra thing that just talks about classes. Like oh. the classes in Final Fantasy Ooh, that's Tactics. That's pretty valuable. Sort of just, you know, talks about what they are. And yeah. I didn't even see that one because you got to leave it alone three times to see everything. My this goodness. one has two movies that you got to wait on the start screen to see. Yeah. Um, the first one is like a really, really good scene. <laughs> yes, and it's, um, the CG is very well done. Yeah. And... Um, it looks very good. It looks very good. But oh. it's, it's, a, it's like movie level, you know, CG. Yeah with fire and a dancing girl and just flash scenes of, you know, moments throughout the game. Um, I, it was hard for me to tell what was going on there, but it was very well done. Yeah, so we'll break that one down in a minute um, because there's a couple of things. Uh, one thing, if you're new to the podcast, we try not to spoil, like, late game events because this will be yeah, a yeah. couple episodes long. You know, the series will go for several episodes. We're yeah. not going to try to... Because a lot of people will be playing this alongside us for the first time, mm -hmm. and we'll have only played up to the assigned section we, we gave to play to. So we're not going to spoil end game events, but there's... So when we talk about Sydney in particular, I'm going to come back and talk about the belly dancer from that opening okay. scene and make a comparison real quick. So, um, But anyways, that's kind of the, the way we do things on these podcasts. But um, once you get through that and get to the start screen and you wait on that screen, you have a, an entire scene that plays out, which is essentially... Um, the VKP headquarters, uh, VKP stands for Valendia Knights of Peace. Mm. So it's like a, it's like a government agency. Um, uh, they basically, um, they're, they're kind of like, well, the risk breakers are a militia, but the VKP is almost like the CIA, I guess, of like the kingdom or something like it that. Seems, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, they're doing special operations and uh, intelligence gathering and things of that nature, and they're they're meant to sort of be the protectors of of the country, right? Mm. So um, they they have a meeting there, and they're they're kind of discussing a lot of uh, really important things. And if you miss this scene, um, Kason was talking about this a little bit on the way over here, and I remember from my first time playing the game, I I just the, the game can be a bit vague. Oh, it's very vague. That's that might be, well, the word I'd use to describe. The intro and the beginning part of this game is intriguing. Yes. But the second word I would use <laughs> is vague. Yes. Um, purposefully vague and well done to the point of being intriguing because yeah. vagueness could easily be just boring, yeah. right? But this game, it's very vague. It's uh, almost like en medias res, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it doesn't give you very much context. Yes. But it's cool enough to where you don't really care. You're like, yeah. I'm willing to put in the work to discover this story as opposed to having it being spoon-fed to me because it's so cool. Yes. Right? And so I don't mind it, but it is very vague. It is very difficult to discern like what's going on. Yeah, and part of this is due to the way the dialogue is written. It is almost devoid mm. of as-you-know dialogue, which is 
in my opinion, a good thing because the characters speak in very natural Generally ways. Generally speaking, that's a good thing. But yeah. what that does yes. is yeah. take away exposition that can fill the player yeah. in on what's happening. And so I think it can be a common thing for players to feel like, oh, I'm not putting all the pieces together of the story. Who are these right. people and what do they want and who represents them and what is this faction and that one? Um, mm. And so, uh, and, and the, the, the pacing of the game is brisk. And so you need every ounce of context you can get. <laughs> So you should watch these movies on the start screen before yeah. you play the game. You really so need to do that. What you were telling me about the second one is that it inserts a lot of that context yes. into the first 20 minutes of the game. Yes, or so. right. Yeah. So uh, anyways, we'll start here on this first scene though. It's kind of like a, a meeting, like I said, the VKP. And um, it, it's so cool. It's a really <laughs> cool scene. And right? Especially for its time. I yeah. mean, this is really, so this stylish. was really something. Oh, absolutely. So stylish. And the, the backlighting on the polygons and like the, the camera movement and the lighting and the the sound, right? Even yeah. the, the audio was so well done, but it's just thunder and lightning hitting. And part of the reason it was done in such an ominous way is because of the limitations of the engine that they developed this game on. Mm -hmm. They could only show, was it five characters on camera at one point without, without overloading the system with too many polygons? They could only show a very limited number of people. I think it's five yeah. on screen at once. Right. So they're meant to have this big meeting and all these people are there, but what it really is, is it's a candlelit table with like four people, yes. but then every now and then you'll hear voices from behind them into yeah. the, in the shadows. And mm -hmm. every now and then the lightning hits and you'll see the texture behind them in the windows and there's just fig figures, dark yeah, like shaped silhouettes. figures, yeah, yeah, silhouettes behind them in the windows. And you're just like, it, you just slowly get the reveal of information that may have been um, like, necessitated by their engines and its limitations, but was turned into just brilliant artwork. Yeah. Like, so, so cool. And so it turns out that there's actually a lot more people here than we thought, and this isn't just some quiet mingling of the two, like, administrators, but this is like a big council yes. of people, and they're all determining what's gonna happen. Yes, and this is actually brings up a great point about one of the things I love about Yasumi Matsuno's storytelling in general. Yeah. Even in scenes where he knows he's got to do some expositional dialogue yeah. to like, like fill people in on what is happening, mm -hmm. he has a way of like setting up reveals within the scene that yes. keep it feeling interesting. It keeps it interesting. So he could yeah. have just created a scene where a bunch of people are sitting around a table talking. Yeah. Instead, he makes it so dark in yes. the room that it seems like, like you're saying, there's just a couple people talking, but then there's a reveal, oh, there's all these people standing back there. Yeah. There's a, 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 and they're a inputting, visually, they're, yeah. Yeah, a visually intriguing way of revealing what's actually happening in yeah. the scene instead of showing it all up front that kind of strings you along and yeah. keeps you visually engaged. And the dialogue does that well too because yeah. as people start saying, hey, we need to do this or that or this or that, well, every now and then you come up to the contentions of, right. wait, I don't know if that's the best option. And then you start to see how this group functions, you yeah. know, and, and the way that they sometimes, you know, some of the, the political intrigue within their group that can occur and cause schisms, you know. Yeah. Very, very cool. And I took down some dialogue from this scene. I have not done this for other parts of the game because yeah. I, I feel like almost every line of dialogue is quotable in this game. I know, <laughs> dude. And that's, in part, that's because of Alexander... O. Smith. O. Smith. It's just, it's just pristinely written. Every word is chosen carefully. Yes, it's very poetic. It's very good. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to do this for the rest of the game, but there's <laughs> some really... Just, just some really great dialogue in the beginning, right? So... Um, Basically, uh, they have what I would assume is maybe like the, what you call like the leader of the council, like somebody who's kind of sits at the front or, or, or sort of like a Chairman, presides. Chairman, maybe a chair, yeah. Yeah, presides over the sure. meeting or whatever, yeah. right? He's sort of like asking for um, some, like a, a briefing of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of people at the table. There's a woman who's like smoking a cigarette. Yes. I love that. Okay, <laughs> this is one of my notes here. I got to put this up right now. This is... Um, Everything they say seems like somewhat modern, despite the clearly medieval setting. Like this is yeah. clearly in a medieval, like you're, they're in this you know large palace castle type place, and then they're um, they're the knights, right? The knights of old, and 
but then there's a woman smoking a cigarette. They refer to another woman as Agent Melrose, mm. an agent, right? Which is a, a modern word. It's almost like anachronistic. Right? Yes. Like they wouldn't use words yeah. like that, right? But Alexander Smith actually talks about that in an interview because oh, he, he calls the weapon that, uh, that Ashley uses in the beginning, he calls it a bow gun. Mm, and one of, yeah. the, um, one, of the, one of his editors was like, this would crossbow. probably be called a crossbow or right. something. But he's like, yeah, but this is sort of a pseudo medieval setting. Exactly. And so like, I think it works uh, because that, of that. That right? adds to the intrigue. Yeah. Because I, you, you've seen and played 100 medieval setting games, right? right? But how many games have you played that go into the medieval like they put one foot into the medieval and another foot into, well, sci-fi modernity, yeah, something like that, you yeah. know. And it's like, wait, now all of a sudden I don't really know where this is going to go, yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't like the typical archetypes that I would usually fill in and say this is what a medieval story entails are are kind of they're not thrown out because this is a medieval type game, but they're they're different, yes. right? I'm no longer. Um, I, my preconceptions are almost blank. I, I'm almost thinking this game could be anything right. instead of, oh, this is a medieval game. You right. know? Mm -hmm. very, it, it keeps very it interesting, right? It's oh, like, absolutely. oh, I haven't seen this sort of take on it before. Yeah, so, a, a knight smoking a cigarette. It's just, <laughs> just fun. Okay, I don't know if she's a knight, but still. So, uh, and the tattoos and everything. Right, yeah. right, right. It's just the, um, the report is uh, essentially about this occupation of the Duke Bardorba's manor. So Duke Bardorba is like the, he's like a senior member of the parliament of this government, right? Yeah. So his duke, or his, his manor, his house, has been overrun by um, uh, like a cult called Mullenkamp, yeah. which is led by a man named Sidney Lasterot. Yeah. So he's basically reporting on this, right, to the, the council here, to the parliament members. Um, he and his allies have taken the Duke's family and servants hostage. They hold the manor as we speak. Yeah. Um, and then the, the presider says, to what purpose? The scum make two demands, the release of their imprisoned comrades and the abdication of Cardinal Battista. So we, we, we're breaking into three, the church, three yeah, yeah, yeah. main factions in the game that you need to remember. Yeah. You have the VKP, the Val yep. Valendia Knights of Peace, that's like the CIA of Valendia. <laughs> <laughs> then you have Mullenkamp, which is Sydney. Okay, so the VKP, we'll just say Ashley Riot, our main character, is part of that group. Yeah. And um, Callo Merlos, Merlos, that's her name, right? Oh, Merlos. Yeah. Merlos, yeah. Merlos. Callow yeah, yeah. Merlos. She and... Or and Melrose. Melrose, sorry. That's what this Melrose. is. Melrose. Agent Melrose. Agent Melrose. Yeah, yeah. Callow Melrose is her name. She yeah. and Ashley belong to the VKP. Okay? Yeah. Then you have Mullenkamp, the cult, which is led by Sidney Lasterot. His, like, right-hand man is Hardin throughout yeah. the game. So that's the second faction. And then the third faction is the church. The Cardinal Batistum is at the head of that. And the Cardinal but has his own knights. Yes, yeah, so those yes. knights yeah. are um, led by Romeo Guildenstern. Guildenstern, yeah. And so he'll become you know, a big part of the story later on. The Blades, they're the Crimson oh, Blades. yes, the Crimson Blades. The, the Crimson yes, Blades. Yes, yes. So the Crimson Blades are like, yeah, like the knights of the church. Yeah. So... You have the Cardinal and the Crimson Blades, Mullenkamp, and then the VKP. Those are the yep. three important factions to remember. And then they would say that we're a risk breaker, which yes. is a part of the VKP. It's part of the one VKP, of it's like the very specialist yes, special agents. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> They're a like a militia breaker. of like super, super elite yeah. sort of like warriors, right? They, they break all the risks. Yeah, they sure do. Okay, so that's what he's talking about here. Uh, the the Mullen camp is asking mm. for the abdication of Cardinal Batista. Yeah. They want him to step down, and they want their comrades to be set free from prison. And they're holding the Duke hostage uh, for this purpose, right? Yeah. Um, and so Ashley responds to this and says, "Yet th their religious freedom within limits is protected." And um, this is another one of those <laughs> modern ideas yes. in a. In an ancient it, medieval setting. Yeah, right? exactly right. The idea of freedom of religion. Yeah, and I love how the next line, it's, it's done on this very kind of cold or matter-of-factly yeah. way. The, 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 the presider, okay, so on what pretext shall we apprehend them? They gotta, they've got <laughs> yes. to like invent a That's reason. That's how the government works. <laughs> That's how all governments work. They, you found it we out. We need to find a loophole that yes. gives us uh, justification yes. for doing this because oh. their religious freedom within limits is protected. Exactly. Right? 
Well, Love but, that. But are they free to uh, kill the Duke? No. Okay. Well, then we, we found it. <laughs> and we then the, the smoking woman's like, we need no pretext. Yes. Mullen Camp is a pack of rogues exactly. hiding behind the priest's frock. We believe them responsible for the attempt on our sovereign's life this Yuletide past. And then Ashley responds, and the VKP will not free their comrades? And then, certainly not. Do you know how many agents gave their lives? And then the, the kind of, he's got like, he's like a heavier set guy, right? Um, who was kind of leading this sort of briefing at the beginning. Yeah, he's got a big forehead. Yep. All because <laughs> of this religious freedom. Too much freedom. Too many gods. Let those cultist cur dogs run loose and they will bite you. Gods while our parliament cowers. He's like, he's like smacking the yeah. table, right? And I love the response to that. Strike that outburst from the record. <laughs> yes, and I think this is the first indication we have that there's a record, that yes. they're on record, and that there's other people Because you hear listening. the voice from behind him say, yes, my lord. Yes, so my there's lord. like more people in the room yes. than we originally thought. Yes, and it's all implicit. Thought. But mm -hmm. as soon as soon, because this is one of the great things that Michael Bay does within his movies. He has a lot of off screen action or corner of the screen corner actions yeah. happening. That as the camera is filming one thing, you're getting hints of action happening off screen yeah. that you're not seeing. But that gives you the illusion that there's way more going on. Because, like, wait, if there's two people behind him, what's who's to say that those are the only two people behind mm -hmm. him? All of a sudden, your mind goes, oh, there could be. Lots of people behind it. How big is this room anyways? We just see it's just black behind them. This could be a huge room. Like we yeah. have no, all of a sudden it calls to attention the fact that we have no idea where we are exactly, but in an intriguing way, not yeah. in a, oh, now I'm confused way. You know, right. now, now your mind gets to fill in the gaps and it's really cool. It's, it's really well it's done. It's just super well done. I mean, it's, it's like. It fills really, out the world. Really super competent filmmaking sort of like techniques yes. being used it, here. That's more or less my point. To keep a they, scene yep. interesting all the way through, even though it's mostly just dialogue about the world that we're walking into for the yes, first time. Exactly. Right? He, he, he's able to keep that interesting by how he sets up and blocks the scene. Yeah. It's, and it's the, really the reveal well of information and the withholding of information yeah. is, is done perfectly, I'd say. So uh, Ashley responds, are cults not the Templars' concern? Why must we be involved? So he's talking about the church side of things. Yeah. The, the, those dudes should be the ones taking care of this. Why are we involved at all? And the answer to that is, our inquisitors have found that Molenkamp's coin comes from the captive duke himself. Indeed, Valendia might still be at war with itself were it not for the duke's heroism. Yet he wields much of his power from the shadows. Even after his retirement, his grip on parliament is unrelenting. So yeah. the duke that they are talking about being <laughs> captured and held hostage mm -hmm. by Mullenkamp is the one funding Mullenkamp. Yeah. This is like things and are really getting a messy big influence here. influence in the general government at large. Yeah, he's yeah. one of the senior members of parliament, parliament yeah. and he basically strong hands it himself. Yeah. He, he's the one running things mostly. So yeah, it's a really messy political situation. Yeah. Um, then you see that flash of lightning that illuminates that there's a bunch of people back there. And this really sort of cements the comic book look that this yes. game was going for. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the, there's some interviews again, I, I, I linked to that one earlier, where you talked to some of the graphics team. Yeah. And they were talking about how that was like, definitely they're, they were going for a comic book feel yeah, to this yeah. game. And that you see that even with like the dialogue boxes and the font choice. The font, it seems almost handwritten. Yeah. Um, that's one of my least favorite things about the game. Because it's a little If I could offer a criticism. Yeah. It's tough to read. Everything's in capital letters. It looks handwritten. I don't like the font. And then the texture is like a paper texture. That's uh, like, I, I get the creativity of how that is a thing to do, I suppose. Uh, but I don't really that, appreciate it. It does in this game. look like that comic book font that they use in comic does, books though. It does. And so uh, that's kind so of to the, the extent that, that that's what they were going for, great. Um yeah. I don't know that that was the right choice for the game, but so as, as it relates to the lightning strike with the figures behind them, it's clear that those figures are sprites, not Yes. Not They're not actual 3D actual models cuz and that's why they could fit more in the shot. That's something yeah. else and you alluded to this that the graphics yeah. team talked about was this was the this was one of the first games um at least at this team, but even that Square during the PS1 era yeah. did in full 3D. Yeah, with the environment and the characters being 3D. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And what they really struggled with was one, memory, but two, uh, yeah. keeping a steady frame rate <laughs> and keeping the game from crashing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When there's too many polygons on screen. Yep. So there was so many things that had to be cut. In fact, Matsuno talks about half of the game's 
uh, scenario having to be cut. Yeah, and the characters and just yeah. all sorts of things. They, they originally, That's unfortunate. They originally intended for Ashley to be joined by other characters, so like yeah. characters that would fight alongside you. Right, I read that. But yeah. these just were not things that they could make work because the entire game was 3D and they had this yeah. hard count on polygons. To, in order to get the game to run, so they just had to cut a lot of these ideas out. See, at the same time, though, it, it is in part due to the limitations that where the artistry really shines forth in this game. Right. That if those limitations weren't there and they could make the game they wanted to, we may not have had such a great abstract artistry sure. that, to, um, you know, that was inserted into the game. Yeah. And it may not have been as good as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was largely inspired by, uh, this is something Matsuna talks about in the interview too. They, he, he calls it Metal Gear Shock. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> when Metal Gear came out, Metal Gear Solid, yeah. it blew the team yes. away. They sure, were like, sure. wow, this is so cinematic. Yeah. Wow, we want to make a game in full 3D like this. We want to make it you know, look like a movie, we, mm. you know, comic book movie sort of like, you know, right. mashup or something. But... Uh, they, they really studied Metal Gear for when they were going to make their cutscenes in this game. Mm -hmm. And that was like part of the decision oh, here cool. to make it in full 3D was they were really um, inspired by Metal Gear. So <clears throat> anyways, but that came with, like we're saying, limitations um, that sort of made them had to make some hard choices about cuts. Yeah, yeah. And you can see that in this scene by the fact that, yeah, they just have mm -hmm. a flat sort of like wall in the background yeah. with... Yeah, a sprite of like Texture, silhouetted yeah. characters shoulder back heads, there. Shoulder heads, yeah. Right, yeah. and they do a lot of creative things like that yeah. to sort of like, you know, make sure the game can continue running smoothly. We've watched him long enough. Now is the time to act. Furthermore, we must find out why the Cardinal sent his blades to deal with this incident without our approval. Inquisitor Heldrick will explain. Mm -hmm. So the VKP is now interested in what is Duke Bardorba's ties to Mullenkamp about? Yep, yep. He's funding this cult. What does Sidney, the leader of Mullenkamp, want? Why has he kidnapped the guy funding him yep. <laughs> uh, at, at his own house? And why did the Cardinal send Try his to blades to, yeah. to, to handle the situation without counseling with us? Yeah. So that's, we got our three Those factions. Are questions. We got yeah, our three yeah. factions. The VKP is like, something is not right here. We got to investigate yeah. this. So they are sending Ashley with Melrose to go and find out what is going on, right? Yep. So they say to him, you will go to the Greylands immediately. A map of the manor grounds is in our carriage. I've sent one of my agents ahead. She will find you uh, when you arrive. And he says, she, and then she says, Agent Merlos. Merlos. Mm. I um, it was Melrose. Uh, it is Merlos. I, I think you're right. It's Merlos. Yeah. Merlos. I correct myself again. It's Merlos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, then it goes to the next scene because now we cut to uh, Merlos now outside we go of to the, the manor. Duke's manor yeah. She's sort of like standing in some some a wooded area outside of like the the gates there. Yep. She's sort of looking on, and this is where Ashley sort of walks in and she's introducing herself. Um, and he just walks past her. He's like, I, I don't know. give a fetch. Just tell me about <laughs> um, how many how many hostages, how many yeah. uh, enemies. He's just wanting to know needs the, what the, the situation is. The right? reconnaissance. But as they're just kind of chatting back and forth, mm. all of a sudden the whole manor lights on fire. Starts, yeah, it just goes up in Somebody flames. lit it on fire and everyone's screaming and their swords clanging and it's like, oh crap, what do we do? Yep, and so she's, she's basically saying, where are you going? Because he starts moving towards it. Yeah. He's like, we gotta wait for, she says, we gotta wait for reinforcements. Yes, this is it's the... Too, it's much dangerous, we must wait for reinforcements. And he says, reinforcements? I am, I am the reinforcements. And that's Judge Dredd. <laughs> I am the law, right? So there's, I really can see this line in two ways. Yeah. It could either be super cheesy, yeah. Or I think with the right performance, it could be kind of a badass cool line. <laughs> but it would you would have to really coach that up and like deliver it in, in well, the right way. Sylvester Stallone did a pretty good job in, <laughs> in Judge Dredd. Um, I think this is one of those lines, not not quite to the same degree as something yeah. like um, Blame Yourself for God from Final Fantasy Tactics. Oh, sure. Yeah. But it is a line, like a beloved line from the game. Reinforcements. I am the reinforcements. I am the reinforcements. But 
to me, it's like that that really could come off cheesy if it's not done. There's right, one other you know? line that I feel comes off cheesy, also delivered by Ashley um, a little bit later on. Okay. But yeah, he occasionally does this kind of thing. Um, but typically, the responses or the dialogue around it is so good, it's not too big a deal. Right. Okay, so now that scene ends and it goes back to the start screen again, right? Um, and then if you wait through that again, you have what is an abridged version of the incident when Ashley arrives at the manor and the blades are trying to put out the fires and Mullen camps there and there's all this fighting going on. Um, it, so it's like cut a little differently. Like it, it shows the events in a little bit of a different order. Like mm. in the actual version, you start off with Guildenstern stabbing the guy and he's falling to the ground and he's talking to his men about putting out the fires and finding Sydney. That's the first part you see. And then it cuts to Ashley running in. In this version, right. it shows Ashley running in first and then it goes to Guildenstern. But it's all really short. It's like cutting out certain I'll lines have of dialogue. To, I'll have to watch it. This is the part that I think I'm pretty sure I missed. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's it's more or less the same scene, okay. but it's just quicker. Hmm. And there are there's some text on black screen that comes kind of in between certain beats that fills in um, some more of like the framework of what this story is going to be about. Right. So I, I copied down that text, and so I'll just kind of read it now. Good. It says we have received a report from the Valendia Knights of the Peace regarding an unsolved felony that may affect state security. It reads, Ashley Riot, an agent of the Risk Breaker Militia, has murdered a senior member of Parliament, Duke Bardorba, and is still at large. The incident began with the occupation of the Duke's Manor a week ago. Sydney, leader of the occupying cult group Mullenkamp, took hostages, demanding the resignation of the Cardinal and the release of prisoners. What was the felon Sydney's true objective? And where on earth are those who escaped? Only Agent Riot, once our dear comrade, can answer these questions. Spare no effort finding him. Also, there is a particular rumor that, he, that many there saw a dragon as the Duke's residence burned. Good luck and Godspeed. So this, it's really interesting because this report would have been written at least a week out yeah. from when the incident actually occurred. Right. So... Anyways, <laughs> there's kind of like a lot in there, but like, yeah, Ashley Wright is our main character and he's gonna end up being blamed for the murder of D Duke Bardorba. Yeah. And he's still at large and so the VKP is looking for Ashley, not only because he's like the leading suspect in this, but also because he's the only one who knows what happened there and what's going on. Because yeah. they don't know what, where Sydney went, they don't know like a whole bunch of things, right? Right. Um, so anyways, that sort of sets up where the story is going a little bit. Um, but the actual scene, the way that it plays out, and we'll fill that out in a second, um, adds a few extra things and there, there's a, lo a little bit more dialogue in that version. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit first about the opening cinematic with the dancer and the dragon and oh, actually yes. setting up weapons and things like that because there's a couple cool details there. So we see a dragon and a belly dancer. Yeah. Um, now, as she's dancing around, she kind of turns, she kind of spins and shows her back and she's got a tattoo mm -hmm. on her back. And it is this symbol that we have back here on the screen. This symbol is called the Kildean Rood. And uh, if you look closely at this version of it, take this off and come back here and show it, demonstrate. You have sort of like a sword handle down here. Yeah. That's like the handle of the sword and the blade is pointing upwards. And you have like these blades sort of crossing kind of towards the upper end of the sword or sort of towards the tip end of the blade, right? So this is the, the tattoo that she has on her back as she's kind of spinning around in that scene. Mm -hmm. Now you'll also notice that Sydney, um, the leader of the Mullenkamp um, cult, he has a similar tattoo on his back, but it is actually inverted. The blade handle is at the top. The blade tip is going downwards yeah. towards the bottom. That symbol is called the rude inverse. And that symbol is really important to the game. In fact, once it comes out to the start screen, the start screen in the game has the Kildean rude in the background oh, of yeah, the yeah. start screen page, yep. right? Yep. So that 
tattoo, that symbol has really special significance to the plot of the game. And so this dancer is the original Mullen Camp. She was the mm. leader, uh, like priestess, of Lea Mond, the city, when it was at the height of its power, like yeah. thousands of years ago. Uh, and so Sidney named his group Mullen Camp after this priestess, right? Um, and so that will be filled out a little bit more later on in the game, but that's why that, because I remember first playing the game being like, what does this girl have to do yes. with this story? Exactly. <laughs> I don't exactly. understand why she's here. Yeah, yeah. Is this just like a way to make it like a sexy intro or something yeah, like that? No, like it's purposeful. There's a reason why they show that and that tattoo she's got on her back is very significant. So keep that in mind as you're playing the game. Nice. Uh, it also shows, uh, like we said, the dragon, but also some shots of Sydney like assembling weapons, which is sort of like a, a foreshadowing of the weapon crafting yeah, system the in the, the game. game. Works, yeah. uh, where you take handles and you put different blades into the yeah. handles. It's all part of the weapon crafting in the game. And of course it shows him fighting the dragon. So there's a lot of fire and it's a cool little intro, but yeah, cool. the important thing to take from that and to remember as you're playing the game, in order to understand the story, is that that woman, Mullenkamp, is important. Kay. So I'm gonna read this little excerpt here that describes what Mullenkamp is. Mullenkamp is a cult and vagrant story headed by Sidney Lasterot. Its name is derived from an ancient dancer priestess of Kiltia, who based her activities in the cursed city of Leomond. Sidney took up the name when he created his cult based upon his own powers of the dark. Mullenkamp was a dancer and the head priestess of ancient Kiltia. She founded the city of Leomond 2,000 years ago, gathering enough followers into her worship of the powers of the dark. With the powers of the dark, she create, uh, created grimoires that hold within them powerful magics. So mm -hmm. the grimoires are items that you find in the game that give Ashley magical abilities, uh, yeah, spells yeah. basically. So once you use a grimoire, which is like, like, like an item in his inventory, he learns that spell permanently. Yeah. So she's the one who created these grimoires back in the day, right? Using the power of the dark. She bore with her the tattoo known as the Blood Sin, or the Kildean Rood. Uh, I'm gonna hold that off for spoiler reasons. Okay. Sydney has a similar tattoo on his back, right? Yes. We'll just put it that way. Okay, so that's what Camp's all about. Now, um, the first scene is also really, 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 I call this the real first scene. The other one's almost like a prologue, but. Well, because the part where you actually get to play. Yes. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's, cool. It's, again, the same thing. Um, I made a whole video on this, actually, as like how to, how to make like a really great opening scene or an interesting hook to your story. Mm. And I feel like Vagrant Story, almost of any RPG, JRPG I've played, is probably the best I've ever seen. Like Final Fantasy VII's up there. That bombing mission's really great. Oh yeah, but for the intro. Final yeah. Fantasy VI, you know, the trudging through the snow, really yes. great introduction. This one for me tops it all. Like this is such an interesting, and it's because it's a combination of like every aspect of what the the the, um, the collaborative nature of a visual medium like this. Your artists, your your composers, your writers, your camera guys the performances, like every part of it is so well done. Like there's nothing about this that is not just like expertly done. Mm. And it, I really, really love the way that it's sort of structured. So it's like, it's basically the way that it works is they'll have a scene play out where they, they bring up a question. They, they yeah. pose a, a mystery and then it will slam to black with some credits, so like opening credits type yes, things, right? Yes, like a movie. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like it leaves you asking a question and then like withholds that for a second. Yeah. Gives you yeah, a yeah. beat to go like, oh man, what is that? Yes. And then it sort of like moves on to the next part of the scene. Yeah. Oh, who's this character? What's going on here? New mystery, slam to black. Yeah. Pause on that for a second, make you consider that. Mm. It's a really creative way to use the trope of opening credits to actually sort of like enhance the excitement or intrigue of the yes. scene. And it works very well. <laughs> Again, similar to the yeah. prologue scene where they string you along in a scene that could have just as easily been a really boring very, yes. council yep, meeting yep. of a bunch of people sitting at a table just talking. Yep. 
and they they withheld information. They re revealed the scene slowly. Yeah, they're doing the same thing with these slams to black and the credits. Yep. And it's 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 really really cool the way that they do that. So it opens up with Romeo Guildenstern, the leader of the Crimson Blades, the commander, I guess, or general. I'm not sure exactly what his title would be, captain. I don't know what exactly it is, but he's the leader of the Crimson Blades. He's like, it, it opens up with a like a guy stabbed in the gut, like falling to the ground, yeah. and this guy just walks over him and just like like picks it up. It's just like, oh my gosh, what happened to this guy? What's going on? And then you know a soldier comes in to report. And this is another technique that I love in this game. The way that they create the illusion of rim light oh, without, yes. without having yes. any real-time lighting in the game. Exactly. There isn't real-time lighting, and there probably aren't even enough polygons no. to accurately do, because you need polygons at certain angles to get that rim light looking good. Yes. But they're able to make it look that way. They, they, they like offset a texture map just a few pixels yeah, off. like behind with or something. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, a, a higher exposure on it, basically. Yeah, yeah. So they basically take this 3D model here, right? They're, they're probably not even rendering the polygons on the other side of the model. Oh, yeah. I yeah. read that in uh, <clears throat> the interview with um, the, the lead programmer. Yeah. He was talking about how they, they had to come up with all these ways yes. to like, keep the game running. That's a way to do so it. So it's because they yeah. have control of the camera, and we have um, character standing uh, profile here yeah. facing each other, don't they don't mean. have to render the... Um, polygons on the other yeah. side of the model. So what they did is they just took, like, a, a, I would just say a single image, and they just, uh, of this character, they offset it slightly, and they just basically brightened it, this man. texture. And that so is what makes so it look smart. like it's got that rim light from the window around yeah. it. And they do this a lot. This That's technique so cool. is used all over the game to create that dark, comic yeah. book look to it. That right? way you can still, so you can have your dark background, but you can still have your four character separated from the yeah. background. And I was actually wondering how they did it. I had some ideas, but that's cool to know. That's good to know. It's it's really cool. I mean, they do it with Duke Bardorba in the following scene where yeah. he's kind of ill in bed and yep. he's sitting there and there's an open window with the moonlight coming in. Yes. <laughs> My note here just says perfect lighting. Yeah. That's all. And like, it's so good. Again, the limitations for like what they could do, they could not use a light in the scene in exactly. the way that they do in modern games, right? right? In modern games, they actually have a simulated light that casts mm. shadows and yeah. like lights these characters, right? And um, they could not use that in this game. And so this is how they came up with a creative solution to give that, that illusion of lighting without actually having any real lighting in the scene at all. So good. So just really cool the way And then the other way off. they would um, create the illusion of lighting elsewhere, like in the backgrounds, would just be in the texture. You yeah. just have the texture get darker in the corners, you know? Yeah, And right. then when you put everything together, it looks like there's a dark spot in the corners. And like yeah. it, to that end, the lighting, if you can call it that, yeah. was, was so well done, not just on the characters, but in the backgrounds and in the, the um, composition of the camera as well. The way that the lighting was used in conjunction with the animation of the camera is, is like so perfect. Yeah, it's like so baked, good. baked into the textures, the shadows <laughs> and things yes, of that yeah, nature. Yes, baked in. And that's, um, that's a technique that was actually used for a long time after this, even like yes. in Resident Evil 4. Right, like there's yeah. a lot of textures in that game that had baked sort of shadows on them to like give this illusion yeah. of lighting and things yeah, like that. It's easy to think that they're just lighting it, but it's like, yeah. no, 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 they, they don't actually like that stuff. Man. Right. They draw it that way. So, um, real quick aside here on the name Guildenstern, right? Some people will probably, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's two characters in this game, Rosencrantz, Rosencrantz. he'll come up later, and Guildenstern. and Guildenstern. But these are characters from Hamlet. Yeah, um, they're kind of like jokey. Characters. Right, they're like <laughs> humorous characters, yeah. and there there actually were other, um, like I think there was a a comedy, like a movie that was made based on these characters. Oh, and there's really? been other comedies written okay. since then that are not Hamlet that Just involve them. Romeo uh, or not Romeo, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. So that's a that's a nod right there to Shakespeare, right? Yeah. Um, Although these characters don't, I wouldn't say they act like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. No, <laughs> <laughs> but they they definitely are named after them. Yes, exactly. Um, These are serious people. So yeah, he's basically asking his man, like his soldier, okay, where is Sydney? Mm -hmm. And split our guys into two groups. Yeah. One of them go find him, and the other put these fires out, like yeah. before it gets out of control, right? And then he kind of goes out the window, and he's saying, like, where are you, Sydney? As he's yes. like looking out the window, right? So that's the that is the 
if you hadn't watched the opening movie, like I hadn't the first time <laughs> I played the game, this is a really great mystery. Like, who is Sydney? Why yes. are they after Sydney? What's yeah, going yeah. on with that, right? And then they slam to black on that. Then we see uh, Ashley run in, and, and I really like this because you hear the sound of some swords or some guys giving chase, yeah. and he sort of like turns because he comes through the gate, and then he sees like a wedge that's sort of blocking the portcullis uh, like uh, yeah. crank. And he just splits that wedge and then she like slams the gate down, but then it cuts to the slams of the yes. black again, oh, so like good. on perfect timing, right? And he's doing this to keep everything in so that nothing can leave, right? He's yes. like, we're gonna keep everything in here and we're gonna figure out what's going on. Right. It doesn't work, but that was the idea. <laughs> also, I really love the way that the music is like perfectly timed to everything. Oh yeah, that the music is so good. It's, and it's really so, good. It's so ominous. I know. And it's not melodic at all, but it's very powerful. So I have a, a quote here that I really, really love um, from Sakimoto, who was the composer on the game. Oh yeah. Yeah, you like you're saying. A lot of the music in this game is not melodic in Which nature. means I'm never gonna hum it. <laughs> it's ever. There still is melody in the game, yeah. you get a really good um, melody on the start screen actually that is a leitmotif that's used all over the game. Mm. It's that da na na na, da na na sure. na na yeah, na 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 That's kind of like the theme of the mm. game, right? So there are melodies there, but a lot of the music is very chaotic and just yeah. like. Very chaotic's a good word. Ambient It makes and your dark. heart, it raises your heart rate. Yes. <laughs> For sure. And so here, here's a quote from Sakimoto. He said, early in the project, I prepared some bright and cheerful tunes like Final Fantasy Tactics, but Yasumi Matsuno told me, forget about Final <laughs> Fantasy Tactics. I want it more deep and heavy. Now you are composing Indiana Jones, but you know what I need for Vagrant Story is the X-Files. Oh, that nice. made me realize my big mistake. The music was actually just fine, but was totally out of sync with the game's concept. I ran and got soundtracks, including the X-Files, and learned from these environmental scores. Hey, uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of that. Like, I, I especially love, and we'll get to this part in a second, but where Sydney and, and Ashley face off in the mm -hmm. opening scene, the music there, it's kind of got these chaotic voices that are moving, like panning in the stereo, like back and <laughs> And it's nice. just like, da, 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 da. it's just like, where is this coming from? Like, yes. it's it's so cool. Like the, the yeah. way they fill the soundscape with all of these unconventional sort of like voices and textures of music yeah. that creates this very unsettling, dark, heavy, environmental, ambient feel to it. Um, and this is something that we've talked about on older, way older podcasts before we did this um, format. You know, the, the, the pros and cons of a more ambient soundtrack versus a sure. melodic one. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that f it's, it's a pretty commonly held opinion amongst JRPG enthusiasts that melody is, is better. better. Yeah. Yes. In part, it's more memorable. It's more nostalgic. Yes. It's easier to hum. Yes. It's easier. It'll lift your spirits because you'll... You'll hear the song. The song stands alone in and of itself, mm -hmm. right? Whereas with this music, the song is meant to serve a higher purpose. Yeah. It is meant to meld together the art of the visual. And I might maybe listen to this soundtrack without playing the game. Probably <laughs> never in my life will I ever actually listen to that soundtrack, yeah. ever. But the value of, ha of the, what it adds to the visual is what makes it so good. And so it's just, there. it's different, yes. right? It's t but I, I wouldn't say one's better than the other because it depends on the goal. Because this one serves I its aim better than the melodies that are standalone where you might get carried off in it not paying attention to the game, right? Yeah. The way that I see this is that games were very different um, in their form from films in their origin. So when games were first, <coughs> the chip tune, you know, coming about, yeah, right? Yeah. And so music was written for those almost as a means of like, it's gotta give you something to sort of like, how do I put this? Film scores are written in sync with events that happen. Yeah. So I've done some 
uh, scoring for video and films that we've made, right? Yeah. And so you're changing like your BPM and you're sort of Constantly like key framing, framing that yeah. so that it will land on moments of impact so that your big like downbeat will come like on an action yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that, right? And so the music is written in a way where it syncs up with what's happening on screen. Right. Video games, mu or video game music in the early days was not written with that purpose. It was written to loop. Well, because they don't know what you're doing on screen. Yes. They can't know where you're going. You're just playing the game, so they just have the music is just on full blast the whole time. Yeah, and it's looping music, usually <laughs> you know around yeah. two minutes long that just yeah. kind of loops. And it's meant to be really catchy and engaging, yeah. and you're like, oh, you're humming this to yourself, and it, it yeah. gives you a good feeling. Mario music is yes. a great example of this. Yes. It's just like, it's just so bright and fun, and just gives you this yeah. great feeling while you're playing the game. It's just, ah, this is great. Yeah. It makes it feel that's the, fun. That's the nostalgia element. Right. But and, it can't possibly predict what you're doing. <laughs> and melody is great for that purpose. Yeah. Right? Sure. Strong, catchy, like yeah. bright, fun melody is absolutely essential in that form mm -hmm. to, to keep something where you're probably going to repeat, be repeating a lot of tasks. Yeah. It might get a little frustrating time to time. Of it's like, because these were very hard games. Because yeah. they, 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 their design philosophy goes back to arcades, which is we want you to keep putting quarters keep in. in those quarters, So we yeah. make it really difficult, right? And so yeah. the kids are going to get frustrated. So we got to get this music in there that keeps keeps it fun, keeps it engaging, mm -hmm. keeps you thinking about the game, right? You're humming it to yourself when you're not playing. It is perfect for that purpose. Vagrant Story is, its cutscenes are basically film. It, yeah. It's basically the same thing as yeah. a film. And Sakimoto was really happy that on, on this uh, project, he got to write more like a film score. He mm. wanted the music to really fit exactly with the beat. Now here's, yeah. the, here's the one conundrum to this. In this scene, even though it's a cutscene with great cinematics and everything like that, mm -hmm. you're still controlling the pace of your reading. Yeah, yeah. And sure. so they had to sort of like learn how to, in this section we need this part of the music right. to, to loop seamlessly, but then also loop into the next segment yeah, yeah. once you've moved to that part of the dialogue. Mm. So it's really tricky there. I noticed, <laughs> I didn't notice a hiccup. I know. It seemed pretty smooth perfect. to me. Perfect. Okay, yeah. It's wow. perfect. I wouldn't have guessed that. How they were able to do that. And that's actually a pretty common thing now. You'll, you'll see things like this. Uh, a lot of people have talked about this with, say, Octopath Traveler, where uh, yeah. music t seamlessly transitions from, like, uh, the field into the battle. Yes. And it's just, like, a heightened, it, it, they have mm -hmm. just a... Like a like a build up dun 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 and it just builds up into the battle theme, but like it seamlessly transitions from one to the other and then back to the other again. Mm. Uh, Fire Emblem Awakening. Oh really? Has like a heightened and a normal version of songs. So, so it's they'll like, just layer it and then drop one. Yeah, and and raise and the sort other. of like fade the other that one makes in. Sense, but the BPM will will match Rem and it'll yes. just go. So while That's you're while you're on your you know map screen, sort of like cha choosing where to go. Yeah. Um, it's playing like one version of the music, but then when they actually zoom into the battle and they're fighting, it's like the heightened version of it. Uh, and yeah. they transition seamlessly back and forth. So this is a similar idea, but they're doing this for cutscenes that have to have the moments of impact and BPM land on exactly yeah. the moments. But <laughs> it's not a set cut of a film because mm -hmm. the player still chooses how fast they read. I wonder if you so just it's complicated. like X, 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 just like <laughs> Bees through all the dialogue. <laughs> if the music, then you might notice a little something yeah, weird going on. That's a good question. Um, but yeah, so he did a great job with that. And in this case, this is, I think, uh, one of the examples I would use where an environmental or ambient soundtrack works better yeah. for the story than a, a more melodic one would. Yeah. Um, I know that there's going to be some version or some games where I think maybe melody would work better for a game like this or maybe this one could use a little bit more ambience to it or something like that. Um, but in this case, I love his choices. I think that the music is brilliant in this game. <laughs> and I do listen to it, but I, I listen to it not because, oh, I'm in the car and I want to listen to some music. I turn on Vagrant Story. Really? I listen to it when I'm writing. So like oh. when I want, when oh, I want there you a go. feeling, yeah, okay. I'm trying sure. to like get gotcha. into the emotions of the characters I'm writing and I need it to be really tense or urgent, Vagrant Story is one of my go-to soundtracks to nice. get that feeling nice. so that I can feel that and sort of like write it. So um, cool. I love it for that reason and I, I do listen to it a lot. 
Um, also, the cinematography here really does a good job of telling the story. Um, so as a great example of this, right? Uh, so Ashley kind of comes in, he sees some uh, Mullenkamp dudes kind of mulling about the gate. Uh, he, he fights some guys in a courtyard and he goes in to the castle or to the manor proper. And he's walking up to a, a door that's sort of cracked open. Yeah. And he's sort of like listening in, right? Mm -hmm. And he's and so he has to move away really quick because two guys kind of come yeah, through the yeah. door. And then he goes back to the door again. He's listening to Sidney and Hardin having a conversation. And like, this is just one example, but it's all over the game. We, we see like kind of a mm, medium wide shot from inside the door where he's sort of peeking in like oh, this. Yeah. But as soon as Hardin mentions Sydney's name, he says, Sydney, it does a cut to a close up on him and he, his, his, yeah. his face shifts. Yep, yep. Cause that's, the, oh, this is the guy I'm this after. Is it, this yeah. is Sydney. The camera is like augmenting the storytelling. Yeah, that's and cool. it's literally all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the the cinematography in this game is phenomenal. Yeah. at augmenting storytelling, and um, I'll try to bring up you know uh, other examples of that when I see it. But like, look for that yourself as you're playing, and notice how they use the camera in the mm -hmm. scenes, and it's just a, a really nice almost. Um, which is so interesting because these were not filmmakers, they were game designers. Yes, yeah. But Matsuno had aspirations, you know, growing up to become a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, like a, it's like a master class on how to use a camera right. Nice. <laughs> it's a video game, right? It's not even a movie, but it feels like that. Um, so it's, it's super well done. But yeah, he comes in as Sydney and Hardin are talking. And, and this is a theme we'll see throughout the game. Sydney and Hardin argue a lot. They're, they're like, they're, yeah. they're working together and obviously loyal to each other, mm. but they don't agree almost ever on what they should be doing. Yes, and, that is and true. And Hardin's always doubting Sydney, and Sydney's yeah. always like, are you questioning my power? Like yes, putting him yes. back in his place. No, I apologize, no, that's not what right, I meant. Yeah. That dynamic between them, but yet they're still friends. You can tell Sydney still yeah. actually cares about Hardin. He's not just mm. using him or something, but he is, really like sharp with him when he needs to be and putting him back in his place. And so he tells him to go and grab Joshua, who is Duke Bardorba's youngest son, or I guess his only son at this point, as far as we know, yeah. um, and take him to Leamond, he says. So this is yeah. a new mystery, like, what? wait, what's Leamond? Like, yeah, exactly. what's that place, right? So they're, they're planning to get out of there, but they're talking about that they were looking for something. Uh, Harden and, and, and Sydney are like, where is it? Like, where is the Duke hidden it? Yeah. You know, th there, there's something specific they came here looking for and they're not finding it. Um, and he's like, okay, we got to get out of here, right? Like the, the, the Crimson Blades are That's on us. That's typically um, what uh, the, his, um, Sydney's friend, Gildan? Or, or Harden, no. Harden. Harden. That's yeah. typically Harden's concern. Almost yeah. every time we see him, he's like, "We got to get going, man. We can't <laughs> hang around too long." And Sydney's like, "Whatever, just chill." And then the next scene we see him, it's Harden's like, "Come on, man. We got to go. We got to get out of here now." It's like that's that's just who he is. He's a very urgent kind of person. Yeah, yeah. it's funny, but it's always that same yeah. conflict. Mm -hmm. And so he goes to get Joshua, and then that's when Ashley walks in and confronts right, him. Right, because it's one on one. This yeah, is the I've time. Got to do the, it. I've got the bow gun aimed yeah. at your heart. Don't move. Bind yourself with this rope. You throw some rope at his feet, yeah. you know. And uh, uh, Sydney uh, basically lunges at him, like tries to strike he him. He grabs the sword. <laughs> and um, yeah. Sydney or, or Ashley shoots him in the heart. Yeah. And he falls down dead on the spot. And it's just like, yeah. whoa, what just happened? Again, the way that they're stringing you through this is just like surprising things yes. keep happening they all keep the time. They keep one yeah, yeah. And so it's like, oh my gosh, Sydney just got shot dead. What's going on? And, and Hardin comes in on this. It's like, no, what happened? And mm -hmm. as Ashley's kind of like bending over there, right? And Ashley stands up to confront Hardin and gets hit from behind by... By Sydney. By Sydney, who's yeah. still alive with an arrow piercing his heart. Which like ups <laughs> it even more. It's, it's just like, like, wait, what? This is crazy. How yeah, does yeah. he have this power? And, and Ashley asks a similar question. I think I wrote down, he says... Leave the back from the grave stuff to the fairy tales, right? See, I, this is what I took note <laughs> on right here. 
leave the back from the grave stuff to the fairy tales. That's not a good line. But I like the next but line the after it. Exactly. You, you and me, we're thinking the exact same thing. The next one, show a little more respect for fairy tales, risk breaker. Yep. And that's a killer response to what was otherwise a lame line from <laughs> Ashley. But it's a more of, similar to the Pirates of the Caribbean line of, yeah. you best start believing in ghost stories. You're in one, right? Yep. Like, I just, I think it's great. So we get a, a really good look during this scene of the rude inverse. That's the tattoo that's on the back of Sydney there. I'll put a, a, a comparison here between the one that's on Mullenkamp's back and the one that's on Sydney's back. And you see that they're reversed, right? Mm. Um, but the same symbol otherwise, just turned upside down. Um, okay, so in response to this, he calls down a wyvern to talk, I guess, and yeah. it just comes crashing through the, the top, and this is your first boss fight of the game. Yes. <clears throat> It's crazy. Yeah. That thing looks <laughs> gnarly. Mike, yeah, cool that is design. a gnarly looking dragon. You know what? It um, has a spear coming out of its eye and it's got arrows yeah. like all over its body and it just looks like it's had a rough time. There was a great um, quote from uh, Akiko Yoshida about his design of this dragon. In fact, I just found it right here, right? So he, he was asked in this um, interview Okay, so it just says here, the dragon concept by uh, Akiko Yoshida. As described above, Yoshida's lack of familiarity with fantasy tropes lends his work a certain individuality. In this case, his dragon has a more squat and hunchbacked figure when compared with typical noble depictions of dragons in fantasy. So a lot of his monster designs mm. and like particular like fantasy designs are very against the tropes of what you tend to see in yeah. fantasy um, stories like this because he didn't have a lot of familiarity with that genre in his, as an artist. He yeah. hadn't like seen or, or, or been drawn to a lot of fantasy art or in like his life. studied it, yeah. Right, and so that's why they're so unique and cool yeah. looking, right? That's pretty cool. So yeah, this dragon looks dope. <laughs> yeah, it looks freaking ridiculous. Um, don't run away from it. <laughs> just just run, hit it as quickly as you can. Yep. Um, and you'll, you, you'll you, kill you it pretty won't, easily. You won't die. <laughs> <laughs> but if you try to find cover, if you try to like do some, anyways. Is that just, what you tried to do? <laughs> well, I didn't. I don't know how the game works when I first play it. Sure, right? yeah. Um, I, this time I actually did just fine. But I remember when I first played the game, um, I was like, "What do I? What, like, what do I do?" Because you look at it and you're like, "This thing's huge. There's got to be some trick. Like, what do I do to kill it?" It's like, no, just run up and hit it, and it dies, right? Yeah. But it just doesn't feel that way at first, and you can hit it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, in the head and neck and elsewhere, but anyways. Um, as you defeat that dragon, um, he kind of walks out to the window because Sydney sort of jumped out of like a pane glass window. He there. did, which um, it, everything one ups each other, right? Yep. So he's dead, <laughs> no, he's not dead, and then, oh, there's a big dragon, and then, okay, we can get him, and he just jumps out the window. Yep. Like, very unexpected. Yeah. We, we run, not very quickly, though. I was a little disappointed at how slowly he walked to the window. Uh, but he gets there, look down, he's gone, right? So yep. Sydney's out. Um, somehow Merlo's got some word as to where he had gone. Yeah. But we, like, the trail just goes cold right then mm -hmm. and there. And then the camera, like, kind of pulls out from the, from the window the with the broken shards. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And, it's so and good. And he just <laughs> asks the question into the air, Leamond, you know, like, what is that, Leamond. right? Yeah. And then the camera pulls back behind him and he's, like, he's like framed in the, the yes. pane glass as the streaming sun comes through. Yes. And the, the, the light, music the crescendos here on that light motif. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Yes. And it just like creates this amazing opening sequence that gives you just the right amount of questions and vagueness to where you're asking all the same questions Ashley is. Like, I mm, got to yep, find out what's yep. going on here. I have oh, to investigate this. So many this. mysteries were introduced here. Not only mysteries of like, what's Lamond, who's Sydney, what's he doing, where are they going? Yeah. It's like, how does this world work? Yes. But it's an intriguing question. Yeah. It's like, okay. This is a world where sometimes you'll shoot someone in the heart and they don't die. Yeah. That's an interesting <laughs> concept for yeah. a world. Like, okay, somehow this is a possibility within this world, right? Um, not just the political situation, but like there's dragons. What else? What other kind of monsters are we going to be encountering here? Mm -hmm. And it seems like he summoned to talk from, from out of nowhere. I yeah. mean, it just... 
Just, it's, so it's so a lot of questions. It's yeah. how does magic work? How does the world work? What? Where are we exactly? What type of fantasy is this? Because it's just so different mm -hmm. from most of what you'd experience. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's yeah. a fantastic opening sequence. One of my favorite in, in any game I've ever played. Um, okay, so then it kind of goes to black, and we get a really interesting uh, message here from a character yeah. named A.J. Durai. Durai. I was very pleased <laughs> to see that this, name. This sort of ties a uh, vagrant story into the Ivelisse setting, right? Yeah. Um, now, this is a bit of a... I, I have to mention that this is a bit of... A retcon. A, a Vagrant Story was not yeah. originally meant to necessarily be an oh, evilly okay. story, but it's cool anyways that cool. AJ Durai is the one saying this, right? Yeah. So, the body is but the vessel for the soul, a puppet which bends to the soul's tyranny. And lo, the body is not eternal, for it must feed on the flesh of others, lest it return to the dust whence it came. Therefore, must the soul deceive, despise, and murder men. Pretty cool little poetic thing there. Yeah. And then this is what cuts into the scene with Duke Bardorba, uh, ill in bed, being, you know, briefed by some of his advisors there. Um, and I think he, he says something like, uh, he tells them to go ahead and burn the whole manor down. And they're, yeah. like, they're like, what? Like, what about your family? It was like, did I stutter? <laughs> I know, burn it, it was down. so funny. He's <laughs> like, my family's my concern. You just do what I say, right? Yep. And they're like, okay, sure. Right. Um, but the kind of, uh, this is where we're introduced to Rosencrantz. So he yeah. sort of sends, Duke Bardorba is sending Rosencrantz to Leomond to like figure out what Sidney's doing. Because like they said in the prologue sequence, Duke Bardorba is funding Mullenkamp. But he seems here to be confused as to what Sidney is doing. Oh, that fool used his wyvern. Yeah. Um, you know, like what is, what is he thinking? What is he doing, right? So he's confused about what Sidney is up to. Yeah. And so he's sending Rosencrantz in to be his man to figure this out. Rosencrantz was a former risk breaker mm. and a former member of the VKP, but right now he's working for Duke Bardorba. So keeping those three factions yeah. in mind, the risk breakers were part of VKP, right? Rosencrantz used to be here, but right now he's kind of in the Molen camp camp. Or <laughs> <that's kind laughs> the Molen uh, camp, of course. Uh, he's in the Molen camp. Because uh, just because he's specifically hired by Duke Bardorba for this okay. scenario, right? So he's being sent there. But there's one thing in this scene to really keep in mind. It's a very big setup uh, for, and, and I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it seems inconsequential, but just keep it in mind. Because mm. at the end of the scene, it sort of pans up on a painting of the Duke and his family. Yes. So you have like the yes. Duke and his wife and the child. And the child. Who appears to be the child that Sidney kidnapped. Took. Yeah, yeah. Joshua, right? Joshua. Um, I'm not gonna say anything more about that, but that is, it, it, they are not just showing that for right. no reason. Right. This is really important. Yeah. <laughs> so just keep it in mind. Uh, I took another note here on the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern reference thing because oh, there yeah. was, um, uh, Alexander O. Smith was asked about that. Since characters like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were obvious Shakespeare references that were found in the original Japanese text, at least from what I understand, was that the jumping off point for the tone or dialect choices for the translation? Because oh, I see. The, the, the Japanese script reads a lot more like a modern, plain, sort of like uh, dialect or language, right? Yes, I've, I've often mentioned this, that Japanese video games tend not to be written in an old yes. old Japanese way, the way yes. that often we'll play Shakespearean English will factor into a lot of the games we play or just an older type of way of talking. They don't do that as much in Japan. They'll just yeah. write it in the normal way. Sometimes they'll use regional accents, but they won't typically use time accents, right? This is what people used to say a long, long time ago. They don't do that as much. Um, so they have to do other things to kind of hint that, oh, this is supposed to be interpreted as some type of Shakespearean thing within the English. Yeah. So there's a couple of really interesting responses that Alexander O. Smith gives in the interview. In relation to this specific question, he says, it was the, a push in the right direction, I'd say, but the story was already pretty Shakespearean in its characters and visual style without the direct references. Sure. That said, I don't think the English script we ended up with was necessarily Shakespearean in its language. The wordplay is pretty limited, 
And while we did go a little archaic, we didn't get that far out of the 20th century. If anything, the recently released at the time book, Game of Thrones, was a stronger oh, stylistic nice. influence for me. Now, <coughs> in also, I'm going to scroll up here because there's another great quote. Right, because it's not totally Shakespearean. Yeah. <clears throat> not it's, completely, yeah. It's just very poetic in that type of way. Yeah, but not. It'll, it'll have certain vocabulary and way of structuring word or yeah. sentences that like nod towards that, mm -hmm. but it's not really written like that, right? Like that sort of like early modern English um, way of speaking. Um, so here's another uh, note from him. I was initially assigned to Vagrant Story as the understudy of another translator, Sho Endo. So Vagrant Story got started and then was like put on hold for a while and then kind of like went back into production mm -hmm. again uh, because a lot of people were working on like on Parasite Eve 2 and other oh, things. Yeah. And so they, they, it got shelved for a little bit. So originally he was an understudy for a different translator, a guy named Sho Endo. Um, as it was my first big wholesale project, having only done portions of Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy um, FFA, I think that's anthology, yeah, Final Fantasy oh, anthology by then. However, there was a production delay, and by the time things really got started on Vagrant Story, I had Parasite Eve 2 mostly under my belt, and Endosun had moved on to other things. I suppose it could have been reassigned entirely, but by that point I'd already gotten taste of the game setting and the writing and was pulling every string I could find to get on that project. <laughs> I think it was the pseudo-medieval setting of that game that spoke to me in a way the sci-fi fantasy of the more recent FF titles hadn't. Mm. And the storytelling was so on point. Shout out to Matsuno. Nice. Um, I'm gonna read some Matsuno quotes probably next time where okay. he, he tries to downplay his own role as a writer and storyteller mm, and say, okay. my team it, I'm just the manager, like my team are the creative ones and things like sure. that. Sure, uh, that's very Japanese. It's a very, it's a, yes, yes, it's a humble <laughs> thing to do. And you want your leader to do that. If you're yeah. leading a team, you want your leader to be like that. Um, I think it, quotes like this indicate, and, yeah. and there's even some others from some of the other team members, Matsuno was very much like he's a, he's a, beast. a great storyteller <laughs> and a very good creative guy, right? Well, um, good. Well, his work speaks for itself. He, he doesn't need to go out and brag. You yeah, know? like why would why would... Uh, Alexander O. Smith shout out Matsuno like that yeah. unless Matsuno had a very <laughs> distinct style to his storytelling. I just had a right? thought. How often do the English translators shout out to the Japanese developers yeah. as opposed to like being frustrated yeah, with being them? Being really frustrated <laughs> with them. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, so he also says the very first thing we had to do back when I was still the understudy for Endosan was translate the opening scroll text. Mm. Our instructions were to make it sound biblical. Cool. So this came oh, from the I Japanese. See. Uh -huh. They were instructed in the English version, make right. this sound biblical. So they, that wasn't just like a choice he made. Oh, Kay. I'm just gonna try to make this sound more Shakespearean right. or whatever. They were told to make it sound like that in okay. English. Nice. So, um, uh, but kind of going back to what we're talking about, about some of the like anachronisms, like the word yeah. agent and things agent, like that. Yes. Um, he said one minor point was the use of the word terrorists. So mm, in the Japanese sure. version by one of the Duke's men to refer to Ashley's crew that struck me as anachronistic in a bad way. And I wrote around that in the translation. It wasn't something I cleared with Matsuno or the team as I recall, but I'd probably make the same decision today. Hmm. So there were some points where he was like, eh, they wouldn't say that. It would be a little too yeah. modern. But at the same time, Bogon and Agent yeah, yeah. Merlos, and Agent. They, they kept some things, but not others. Hmm. Anyways, um, interesting stuff. But uh, that's the reason why they chose like the style of writing that they did. But I do think that for the most part, like I was saying earlier, this game does it better than Final Fantasy Tactics War of the Lions. Um, in a way that's yeah. easier to follow for yeah, yeah, someone yeah. who might not be like super, uh, you know. Each cutscene is still very brief, very packed with information, yeah. uh, very quick, but the words aren't as flowery, but it's still, um, it, it's impactful. It's really well written. Yeah. So uh, that being said, um, I think we're going to stop there for today. We didn't get nearly as far as I told people to play up to. That's all good. But I think it's okay. There's so much at the beginning, and we're yeah. probably going to cover that ground that we didn't get to next time. Pretty quickly. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I think we'll get through it pretty quickly. There wasn't a ton that necessarily happened. I mean, there's some good plot reveals and moments, but um, it's a lot of puzzles and fighting. So. Yeah, exactly. And um, this is where like the game proper really starts. Yeah. Is when you get into Leomond itself. Exactly, yeah. So we'll talk about Leomond next time, the inspirations for that city, 
Um, and then the story will really start to take off at that point with like Ashley's memory lapses and mm. this is where things really start to like po become. Possibly a, a, a ghostly figure showing <laughs> up and influencing yep. things. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a it's lot great. to get into next time. But we're oh, and there's a freaking Taurus. Got to mm -hmm. kill a Taurus. The, the boss. The that boss fights sweet. are really good. They're really they're good, and but the designs of the monsters are so good. Yeah, and that kind of plays they're back just creepy, again man. to. Um, we'll talk about it next time, but that plays into uh, what Yoshida was saying. Yeah. Like he's not he doesn't using draw these things. traditional fantasy tropes as his yeah, inspiration yeah. for how to create monsters. So, like the ogre, for instance, the mm. ogre. Does not look like I would not look at that monster no. and say ogre. Ogre, yeah, exactly. That does not scream ogre to yeah, me yeah, in yeah. design. But it's a really creepy and cool yeah. design. Oh yeah, uh, and it's one of my favorite bosses in the game, um, especially like the way it's set up. It's just kind of it's there and it just like runs straight at the camera. <laughs> it's yeah. just like whoa! It's just really intense. Um, anyways, so yeah, the, the monster designs are phenomenal in the game and very atypical of fantasy designs, right? Yeah, uh, medieval fantasy designs for monsters. So. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, start recording our Patreon exclusive uh, analysis for this month. Yep, it's Check on, us out it's on, on the movie Arrival. Oh, dude. If you yes. care to know what we thought about that. So, some of you Patreon. guys have noticed uh, Kaysen's enthusiasm and passion for languages. <laughs> this is like the perfect movie for Kaysen to analyze, <laughs> the, the movie Arrival. So, if you want to <laughs> you want to see him like go off, which is probably going to happen here, uh, <laughs> check out our Patreon. And uh, at, at any level, it doesn't matter. There's no, like, yeah. it's not tied to any level. At any level you want to um, contribute, whether it's one dollar, as low as one dollar, you get to see those extra podcasts, All that one it, extra yeah. podcast every month. So yeah. um, check that out if you want to support the show. We appreciate you guys, and we'll see you again next week. Peace out. <laughs>